church. Take your hymn book if you would. That song she's playing is a new name written down in glory. It's the All-American Hymn Book number 131. New name written down in glory. Amen. I remember that night. My name got written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> Hallelujah. His body still there. Amen. Still there. I was once a sinner.
ever was or ever will be yes. is our Savior arose from the dead yes. right. Amen. and lives sitting at the right hand of God. He's coming back. Yes. 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 He's coming Maybe back. Then. He's coming back. Might be before so we get done. Maybe we, better open, maybe we better open all the blinds so we can see him. <laughs> Time you get them blinds open, you're gone. Yes, ma'am. All right, how about 28? There shall be showers of blessing. 28, there shall be showers of blessing. Man, just so it ain't snow. <laughs> <laughs>
thing for you. Oh, I reckon. You know, you're one yeah. heartbeat away from death. Yeah. Tomorrow is a scary, scary thing if you don't know the Lord as your Savior. This would be a good day to take care of that, wouldn't it? Amen. Amen. It's safe. Today. Trust Stop. Jesus today. Amen. Someone else have another song? Yes, ma'am. Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. 116. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> Victory in Jesus.
everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, I ask you for your help today, Lord, and you'd bring my mind from being scattered and bring it to rest upon you, Father, and upon your word. Help me to not speak anything that's harmful to your word. Uh, Father, it would bear false witness to it, but help me speak it in truth, clearly and plainly, that we as your children would be encouraged today, that we'd be drawn to your great gracious love that drew us to Calvary, that showed us our dear blessed Savior, that showed us that fountain of great grace, His precious blood, in which all of our sins have been washed away. We thank you and praise you, dear God, for such great and wondrous love. Now I pray, Father, for be one here today without you as Lord and Savior, that today would be their day of salvation. Today would be the day when they put their sins under your blood. Know what it is to have their name written in the Lamb's book of life. To know what it is to pillow their head at night. And know if they not wake up in the morning, they'll rest in your bosom for all eternity. To know what it is to have the peace that passes all understanding. To know what it is to have joy and joy and joy beyond anything man can imagine. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us. They use this day, our worship. Father, it's a sweet-smelling sacrifice. Father, of our praise and of our worship of you. And let your word, Father, have its work and will in our lives. I ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. John 3.16 you know, we live in a world where it's hard to see the love of God. We live in a world where wars are normal, where people's lives are disrupted and torn apart by greed and theft. We live in a world where some people drank their way into oblivion last night and pillowed their head upon a cardboard box in some back alley. We live in a world where men and women stood upon street corners and sold themselves into the slavery of prostitution. We live in a world where communities gather together in their little hubble, little drug communities where our society wants to go in and clean them up and make things right by some sort of a, a governmental edict where we can somehow believe that we can legislate morality or we can change people's lives with programs. We live in a world where people, instead of trying to live in peace and harmony, would rather kill and murder and rape and pillage. You say, Gary, that's not a very pretty world. And it's not a very pretty world because for the most part it's absent from the love of God. I hear people today say, well, why, God, why doesn't God do something? If God's in control, God's not in control of this mess. Don't blame it on Him. He didn't stir this thing up. Man whose heart is darkened by sin, who has veiled the light of the love of God from it, has taken and flushed the, flushed the sewer pit of life across this world that we live in. And from there in the throne of glory where God had created this world as a place and of a people who were to please Him, to bring joy to His heart, He looks down upon this place 
And for the most part, I would think that he'd just pick up a club and come down here and, and hit this place, hit earth like it's a baseball, and send it somewhere in outer space to die. But from his throne in glory, he didn't look down on us in hatred. He looked down upon us with a compassion of, of a heart that only God can have for his creation. Yes. It's been said that if, that if you take all the verses preceding John 3.16 and all the verses after John 3.16 and just do away with them, there would still be enough gospel there would still be enough blood. There'd still be enough in John 3.16 to save every man, woman, and child in this world. Amen. John 3.16. Most of the time we, we see it hung up behind you know, football stadiums or basketball. They get around the goal and they hang up the job. I appreciate their witness. I really do. But that's usually on a Sunday. They probably ought to be in that Lord's house somewhere worshiping. John 3, 16. One of my favorite stories, and I'm going to get into my preaching here just a little bit. But I, I, one of my favorite stories is about a fellow by the name of Henry Morehouse. He was an evangelist. He, back in the uh, 1800s, and mid-1800s, uh, he was an Irish-born fellow and got over there in Ireland. And he was he was he was one of those fellows that drank hard and lived hard and played hard and wound up in his life as a mess. And one of the great revivals swept through that area and swept Henry Morehouse into it. The next thing you know, instead of hanging out at the pubs, he was hanging out on the street corners preaching Christ. The only hope of humanity. Preaching the love of Christ. A fellow by the name of Dwight L. Moody was in Ireland holding one of his crusades and Henry Morehouse come up and introduced himself to him and he told Mr. Moody, he said, Mr. Moody he said, one of these days I'm going to come to Chicago. He said, Can I, I'm going to come and I'm going to preach in your church. Mr. Moody thinking he'd never see him again said, well that'd be fine. Short time later, he gets a call. He said, Mr. Moody, I'm in Chicago. So I'm going to come to your church and preach this Sunday. But Dwight L. Moody was leaving town. He was on, going on to another meeting. And he told his deacon, he said, let him preach. If he preaches well, let him preach at night. And so Henry Morehouse got up and he preached on John 3.16 that morning. And the folks had him to come back that night and he preached again. And he said, I searched the Bible through for a better text than what I preached on this morning. But I can't find one better than John 3.16. So I think I'll just preach on it again. And so he preached on John 3.16 again that night. And then he preached on John 3.16 again the next night. And he preached on John 3.16 again the next night. Dwight L. Moody come back from his meeting and he come in and asked about and inquired about the man. He said, his wife told him, he says, says, Dwight, you need to come to the meeting tonight. He preaches different than you preach. He <laughs> said, you need to learn what he's preaching. He preaches about the love of God. So Dwight L. Moody went to the meeting and Henry Morehouse walked up to the platform and Mr. Moody said he was thinking about, I wonder what he's going to preach. And Henry Morehouse said, I got up there and I climbed up the golden ladder of Jacob and I peered over into heaven and I asked God, I said, God, what ought I to preach tonight? He said, preach John 3.16. He says, so I'll come back down to stand in this pulpit to preach to you John 3.16. And so he preached that night on John 3.16. He came back the next night and he preached again on John 3.16. And he preached again the next night and the next night until revival broke out into the Moody Tabernacle Church. Amen. Dwight L. Moody himself was
was so moved by the message that he went home and he began to study every verse in the Bible on the love of God. He said it transformed his life. When you live in a world that is so dark and so full of hatred and so empty of the love of God, man, to be able to turn that light of His grace on in your life, to be able to turn the light of His love on in your life, there's no greater thing in the world than that. John 3.16 we get hit with some things right off the bat that's kind of hard to take. We live in a world that wants to live without God but John 3.16 says for God yes. for God mm -hmm. for God yes. you're faced that there is a creator one of these days you're going to have to face yes. that creator yes. Amen. for God in the beginning God had created the heavens and the earth we didn't crawl out of some slime pit somewhere. We, the very first words of John 3.16 rebukes evolution right down to the ground. Yes. Yes. Evolutionists believe that you and I came from a rock. He said, oh no, we just descended from some lower life form. No, if you trace it back far enough, you find out you believe they came from a rock. Mm -hmm. The first life came to earth when Billions of years ago, and we were just sitting around here in a dry rock. That's all this earth was. And somehow or another, it started to rain. And so it rained on that rock. And somewhere around that rock, this little primordial bowl of soup began to build this little bowl of water. And on that rock, there was a little algae formed, or a little something grew there. Don't know where it come from, but it's down there. And so from that life came this little amoeba wiggled out. Mr. Your great, great, great grandpa was a bowl of Campbell's soup. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell you where great, great, great grandma come from. No. <laughs> Man's got to face the fact yes. that God is their creator. Yes. The very next words of John 3.16 corrects the false character that most worldly people give to God. For it says, For God so loved. You know what most people's idea of God is? He's some ogre sitting up there on the throne with a club going to come down there and bat you and this, this whole planet plumb out of sight. I mean, he's going to hit it over the center field wall and there ain't going to be anything left. God's just waiting to judge you, jump on you and rip your life apart. Just waiting for you to stumble and fall and so he can do something to destroy your life. And that is not the character of God at all. It never says God is hate. It says God is love. That's who he is. Here the atheists come up and say, oh, you know, religion has called more death in the world than anything else. They're right. Particularly if you count the religion of communism. Mm -hmm. Amen. All, all fueled by the religion of evolution. Yeah. Yeah. But th what they're wanting to do is go back and say, well, you know, God said you've got to go kill this bunch of people. You've got to go take their life. You've got to destroy them. What they're not willing to do is go back and look who those people are. Those Midianites, the Amalekites, those whom God ordered to be destroyed. Why? Because these were people who were willing to even burn their own children in sacrifices. To the God of Molech that had given their life so far away from who God was. They become little pictures of Noah's day when God destroyed the world because man had rejected God. He said, well, I must have been a hateful God to destroy the world. For 120 years, he sent Noah out there and Noah preached righteousness. He preached to them the need to repent, to turn from their sins, 
to know that there was deliverance for them and they, they absolutely thumbed their nose at God and went their own way. Amen. God's love. He is love. It's not something that He does. It's not what He practices. It's what He is. Yes. For God so loved. God looked down there and He looked at this world. God so loved this world. But you know who he was looking at? All the way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. People said, well, he just should have wiped Adam and Eve out and started all over again. But he couldn't do that without destroying your life. He looked not only into that pair's life, but you were in that pair. They are, they are the mama and daddy. They are the great, great grandma and grandpa. And had he destroyed them, he'd had to destroy you. But he loved you. Yeah. Yes, he did. Amen. He created us to have fellowship with him. To know what the joy of that fellowship was. Can you imagine walking around the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden? Getting into a little park bench. You know, God put a little park bench right off to the edge of the garden. You've been there, ain't you? You know where the flowers all grow up and bloom over? There's a little trestle there. You go and you sit there and the cool of the day God comes along and sits down there beside you. You think, oh, I don't find that in Scripture. Well, it's not. That's, that's just... Do you know what that's like? To sit down with God and fellowship There's people today, boy, they would they just slobber to mouth to be able to sit down and talk to them, you know. Well, if I could just meet this person or that person. I'm telling you, you can meet the God of this universe. God who is love. Loves you. Loves you like nobody else in this world ever loved you. John 3.16 reveals the character of God. 1 John 4 eight, God is love. Yes. We see that John 3.16 also reveals the true character of man. For God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed him should not what? Perish. Perish. Men are living in peril. Yes. Every day, one heartbeat away, one breath away, yes. one moment, one tick towards eternity is all we have in this world. And it can disappear before you blink an eye. And if you die in your sins, then you've made a choice to reject the love of God. He said, well, a loving God wouldn't send anyone to hell. No. God's not willing that any should perish. That all should come to repentance and faith. A person that goes to hell goes there against the will of God. You have to walk. You have to walk through the blood of Christ to get there. You have to climb to the mountain of Calvary and say, I count the blood of Jesus Christ as nothing. But maybe the one thing that John 3.16 leaves out is the why. Why does God love me that? Why does God love you that much? At a time when the only thing I knew about God was how to use His name in vain, cared no thought about Him, and all that time He was loving me. Yes, He would. Why? Because he sees our need. 
He knows we're going to perish without His help. He's like someone standing on the edge of the shore, maybe maybe at the brink of Niagara Falls, and you're headed over. You know, you thought going over the barrel might be fun, right? And he's standing on the shore with a rope, ready to send it out to rescue you, and you throw it out and throw it back at him. He throws it out, you throw it back. God says, grab the rope. I want to help you. I want to change your life. You're going to perish if you don't. And we live in a world today where day after day after day the gospel is resounded across this world where people are preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, standing on the street corners, preaching the gospel to a people who just keep throwing a rope back in the face of God. Yeah. Amen. And we have a great need. We're going over. We're going over without any help. Perhaps He loves us because of what He can do to our lives, what we can be in Christ. The Bible says any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. He's, he's there to change our life. Amen. He wants to make something new out of our life. Can you imagine that? A fellow by the name of Mel Trotter. The young man, he became a barber lived in uh, Chicago, became a barber and got into gambling, took up drinking and before long he was an alcoholic and every penny that he could buy or steal, he bought alcohol with. He went home to his wife, he got, somebody got a message to him that he needed to get home his child was sick. He went home to a house that was empty of heat in the middle of a Chicago winter to a baby that had gotten sick and ill in that cold house to a wife who was carrying that baby in her arms that had breathed its last and had died. Before he left, he went in to his child's bedroom and stole the baby's shoes and went and sold them and bought alcohol with them. He became so depressed, he decided he was going to march down to the lake. I'm talking about one of them great lakes after and drown himself, just going to wait out until he didn't come back. On his way, he passed by a door of a mission yes. called Pacific Garden Missions. Yes. And there, Mel Trotter walked on past, and he heard somewhere coming behind him a man who was preaching on the love of God. And he said he got angry inside of him and said, God doesn't love me. God can't love me. And he turned around and he walked back into that church, that little mission, and flopped down on the back of the pew and he sat and listened. And the man continued to preach about the love of God. And there that drunk's heart began to waver as he thought, it's possible that maybe God does love me. And it was said that they gave an invitation and Mel Trotter sat in the back and said, if anybody here wants to receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, won't you slip your hand up in the air? And he said when he slipped his hand up in the air, he said his old ragged coat fell back upon his arm and yeah you could see the dirt and the grime and the filth where he'd been laying in the gutters and the man came back and knelt down with him and said would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior would you like to know the love of God in your life and Mel Trotter said yes 
And there he bowed his head and received Christ as his Lord and Savior. That old drunk rose up out of the ashes of a useless life and became one of the greatest soul winners. Opened up missions all across the cities, all around the United States. Led multitudes to Christ. Maybe God wants to demonstrate His love in your life so that others' lives can be changed, so that they can know, so they can understand the love of Christ. In this world that we live in, in all of its darkness, we look around and, you know, we can live in a little world and grow flowers and make our little spot, you know, happy. But folks, we live in a world that's covered in darkness. Yes, amen. And in this world, it's hard to see the love of God. But if you would see the love of God, if you would to know the love of God, then you're going to have to go to a place. It's a place called the Skull. Just an old rocky stone heaved up out of the ground. And there you're going to have to go and you're going to have to look. There in the middle of those three that were crucified there that day. One who's had his flesh ripped off of his body. One who was beaten till his face was swollen beyond recognition. One whose very blood was being shed that day as Jesus had said before he went there that the shedding of this blood is going to be for many salvation. But many could be saved. Yes. Not all, but many. People who would dare to pause at that mountain and look and see the love of God. For my Bible tells me in Romans chapter 5 verse 8 that God commended His love toward us. Amen. That God commended His love towards me. And while I was yet a sinner, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died so we wouldn't have to. No greater love hath any man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That day he laid down his life for you. We think of John 3.16. What's it take? What's it going to take for your soul to know the love of God? You say, oh, I'm not bad. I'm not. I, I live a good life. I, I'm doing okay. Is the love of God sprung up in your heart and your life? Heard an old black preacher preach on this subject one time. He said, he said, I climbed up into heaven and he said, I got old Gabe. He said, we come back down. He said, I took Gabe down to the place where the people with some money in their pockets live. And I said, Gabe, what's it take? What's it take? For that man to get saved. Said old Gabe said. John 3.16. Amen. He says so I take him down to the other side of the tracks. And I take him down where people are living in. With places with just a little tar paper on the walls. And I say to him. Said Gabe what's it take for them to be saved? And he says. John 3.16. So I take him to the house of the prostitute. I take him to the house of the prince. What does it take to be saved? It takes the love of God. John 3.16 There's 
There's enough grace and love to save this world. Do you know the love of God? If you've been to Calvary, you do. Do you know the love of God? You'll know what it is to have your heart squeezed like an orange until the juice flows out your eyes. Do you know the love of God? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know everlasting life? If you know the love of God, you do. For God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again for your love and your mercy. Lord, all that day when the Holy Spirit walked by my heart and showed me how much you loved this creature who was so unlovely. In the vileness and the wickedness of my sin, you still loved me. I thank you for that day, Lord. And I thank you for the precious blood that cleansed me from all of my unrighteousness. Father, that gave me eternal life. That, Father, I want to know that from not only in this world will I experience your love, but forever and ever and ever to be in the presence of you who are love. Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise. And if there's one here, Lord, who does not know you as Savior, I pray today they'll call upon you and be saved. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Do you know the love of God? Do you know what it's like to have the God who is love living inside of you? I pray you do. Let me close with this. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled. He pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Where we stalk on earth a quill? And every man is scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. The love of God, oh, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and the angels' song. Yeah. The love of God. I pray you know it. And enjoy it. Amen. Enjoy the love of God. Amen. All right.